Welcome everybody to Tales from the Jar Side. Let's jump right into this week's newsletter. The title this week was Tales from the Jar Side, Generating Robot Images with Java. Got a lot to say about that. Some useful spring videos. Craig Ferguson is funny. Google is evil. We have to talk about that. Elon is awful, which I don't want to talk about at all. And the usual toots and skeets, and they are what they are. The subtitle this week is Been Injured by Water Droplets in Clouds? You may be entitled to condensation. Welcome, fellow jarheads, to Tales from the Jar Side, the Cousin IT newsletter for the week of September 3rd through 10th, 2023. Today is September 11th. This week I taught week one of my Spring in Three Weeks course and my two day getting started with Spring and Spring Boot course, both on the O'Reilly Learning Platform. Just wanted to point out to, to noted jarhead Bill Fly that I actually got the dates right this time. <laughs> He's very quick about pointing out when I forget. Oh, well. Regular readers of and listeners to and, of course, video viewers of this newsletter are affectionately known as jarheads and are far more intelligent, sophisticated, and attractive than the average newsletter reader or listener or viewer. If you wish to become a jarhead, please subscribe using the button available. I want to take a moment now to take a look at the YouTube channel. So let me open up that page. And here we are on the Tales from the Jar Side YouTube channel. And it looks like I am now up to 664 subscribers. <laughs> Two more to the magic number, I suppose. The big new video this week, in addition to the newsletter video, is this one called AI Projects in Java in that series known as generate AI images from Java, specifically on the DAL-E image generator, the one from OpenAI. I talk about that in the newsletter. Now, I should also mention that I did extract a short from that, and it's called JavaFX Carousel of Generated Robots. So you can see 30 seconds of a series of robot pictures rotating one by one every roughly three seconds. If you're interested, it goes around and around. Kind of fun. I'll show you that later. Okay, back to the newsletter. So the first section is called Generating Images with Java. And in last week's newsletter, which I suppose I should have linked to, but I forgot, I talk about how I wrote code to connect Java to the Dolly image generator using the Open API API. Open AI API. I keep doing that. At any rate, if I click on this just to show you what I mean. This is the section of platform.openai.com that talks about what you need to send to create an image, what you get back in terms of URLs. And the image itself up here is simply a block with a URL in it. Well, I changed things a bit because it turned out to simplify life. If instead of getting back a URL and then making an additional request for that URL, instead I use the B B64 underscore JSON option in the image instead. That means that instead of getting URL back inside the response, there will be a field called uh, B64 underscore JSON, I have to set the response format to that. And then I just have to decode the binary encoded JSON string. And I have my file immediately. Figured why make an extra call when I can just get the image back directly and use it. So all of that is in the video. I go through the whole thing. Uh, this Im this uh, robot on the cover, by the way, on the so-called thumbnail, is one of the robot images I generate. Now I have to admit, the robot images from DALI are a bit more primitive than the ones you'll get from either Stable Diffusion or Mid Journey. This week, I promised I was gonna do a video on doing all this with Spring, and I may do that, but I'm awfully tempted to take a quick diversion and just do the Stable Diffusion ones. Same, similar video, just using Stable Diffusion, just to show you how the JSON's different, the process is similar, still get the images out. I'll talk to you about it later. Okay, so here was the prompt that generated that inside the code, inside a test case, I put a realistic photo of a robot leaping into the air in joy after accomplishing a difficult task successfully. That's not a great prompt as these things go. There's not a lot of description of what things are supposed to look like. 
There's no background or lighting or anything about the camera or anything like that. And a lot of people do. I just wanted to see what that would do. And it worked. I mean, you saw it, at least one of them that I got out of there. I'm still using Java's HTTP client API to transmit the JSON data to the service. And then that's serialized by using JSON, the Google parser. When I switch over to Spring, then the Jackson parser will be built in and I'll have to play with some settings to get it to do the same stuff. And of course, I won't need to deal with the HTTP client directly. I can either use the web client inside of Spring, or if I wait until Spring Boot 3.2 comes out, then there's a new REST client that would be synchronous and everything, and that would be interesting. But I probably won't wait that long. I'll probably just make the video anyway and then, you know, update one or make a new one when Spring Boot 3.2 is released, which I believe will be in mid-November. And then we'll see. What made it interesting, again, I pointed out, was that I used the 64-bit binary encoded JSON. And the other thing that was interesting is it turned out I just needed to decode that. And I just asked the AI assistant inside of IntelliJ, which is really just a, you know, it's just chat GPT customized to work with code. The idea is that in the java.util package, there's a class called base64. It has a method called getDecoder, which has a decode method that takes that string and will return a byte array. So all I had to do was write that byte array into a file with the file extension .png. Uh, my son is amused that I refer to those as ping files. But I mean, you know, PNG, how would you pronounce it? I don't know. At any rate, so I did that. And I also used GitHub Copilot to help me write the code. And it came out very, very easily. Now, since I had that, I decided to ask the GitHub Copilot if it could help me, or actually the AI assistant, if it could help me write some JavaFX code to create that little image carousel. That's what this guy looks like over here. Incidentally, as long as I'm here, here are the images now. I've refactored them to go into an images folder. And this is like the typical image that I get from Dolly. A couple of these here. You see, I like that one. And a couple others. You know, they're fine. These last couple I did using stable diffusion. And look how much more detailed and realistic that is. Or this one here, or I believe this one as well. I mean, what a what a step up, right? Now these are 1024 by 1024. They didn't have a 512 by 512 setting. But nevertheless, I was able to run it through my little image carousel, which is here. And the image carousel loads up all the images into a list of image and puts an image view onto a scene. And then there's this animation with a duration and a keyframe and a timeline just rotating the images through every three seconds. So there's the scene for it. This is a little block to load the images. Again, I basically got all this code right out of um, AI Assistant. And when I execute this, uh, it came up on the wrong screen. Let me move it over. You can see the images are there and they're rotating one by one every three seconds. I don't know how many I'll keep around, and I did not check the images into the GitHub repository. I figured I'll just generate them. There's no need to upload all those megs into the repository for no reason. If I just close this, then it will shut down the Gradle build. I had to use Gradle to uh, execute it because there's a lot of dependencies associated with JobFX, and I didn't want to add the library to my IDE, which is what it wanted if I want to run through a main method. So instead, I just ran it through Gradle, and it came out fine. Uh, I did want to point out that in my Visual Studio, not Visual Studio, <laughs> YouTube Studio, that when I first uploaded that short, it wound up with like 20 views, which is not a huge number, but it got, you know, it started off pretty well. But look at the average percentage viewed was like 267%, which means most people were watching it rotate through uh, two and a half times, something like that. If I take a look at my, uh, my current settings on that, just to see where I am now, then I can tell you that I currently have just under 50 views, and the 
average percentage viewed has dropped to 156. So people are still watching it like one and a half times if you count all of them. But I just thought that was amusing. That's by far my shortest short of all of them. Mostly I tend to take a full minute, but nevertheless, it was uh, entertaining to do. Okay, and that's everything. I've already told you everything in here. Let's move on to the next section. Now, I did a fair amount of watching videos this week in addition to creating them. There's a new project at Spring called Spring AI. And I mentioned this in an earlier newsletter because it got announced at the most recent Spring One conference, which was part of VMware Explore or whatever. But the conference, the uh, rather the um, the project is in early alpha form. I think I mentioned here the version number on it is 0.2.0. .0. But nevertheless, uh, I mean, I, I, I mentioned one thing is preliminary stuff. So let me go in order. One thing I mentioned is that the fact they created the, that project was both validating and kind of frustrating to me at the same time. It was validating because it showed I was on the right track coming up with this whole idea and, and going ahead and tying the OpenAI API into a Spring app. That's That makes sense. But it's a little frustrating because, of course, they're going to get all the press. All the traffic's going to go there, and as it should. I mean, obviously, they're, they're being official about it. The other thing is, is that they're really going into detail. They're digging into all the aspects of it and putting it on the cloud and working on inputs, which they're calling prompt, uh, something about prompts. What did they call it? prompt templates and they're also working on the output which they're calling output parsing and they have these data loaders and doing embeddings and everything i just wanted to connect and generate some images so mine's really simple theirs is a lot more elaborate it'll i'll keep an eye on it and see how it develops the reason i bring it up though is that craig walls made a video this week now craig walls is the author of the spring in action book which is currently in sixth edition. I'm sure there's a seventh being planned. And he made a video called Introducing Spring AI, Add Generative AI to Our Spring Applications. He did not do anything with image generation. His was on, and in fact, Spring AI doesn't say anything about image generation. It's all talking about chat. So sending and receiving messages and ultimately putting them into some kind of chain. So the output of one becomes the input of the next and so on. And Craig, went through the basics. So I do recommend it. He does a very good job of this video as usual, you know, and take a look. And I will be presenting something similar, but scaled down. And mine will just be, just, let me just show you how this works. And maybe I'll do the image generation because that's certainly not going to be part, at least for the time being, of Spring AI. If I do check the project, however, this is a link to the overall project and the reference guide at Spring AI. You see they have a section on AI concepts and they're talking about chaining calls and output parsing and prompt templates and retrieval, automated generation, all this stuff. But there's nothing in here that says anything about images. The getting started points out that you, you still have to set up your key and export. It's like, that's exactly what I did too. So that too was reassuring that you do set up your key as an environment variable and read it. And then they also incorporate Azure as their cloud provider. They even have a little command line interface for it, which I haven't tried out yet, but that's nice to see. And they've got a couple of sample projects, including a Hello World project using OpenAI and a few with Azure, but again, not, not terribly complicated. Most of the API is all TBD. See, this is empty, 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 all the way through the documentation. So we'll see how that works out eventually. I will be keeping an eye on it. Okay. Let's move on to our next section. Now, Dan Vega, who's another person I've had on the live stream, and also he's a big name in that spring industry. He does a lot of YouTube videos and, and other dev advocate related stuff. He released a new video on the REST client coming with Spring Boot 3.2. That looks very attractive. If you're not aware, then Spring has had this client called the REST template for many, many years. 
and the rest template is synchronous and blocking but it's a simple template method interface and I, I really like it. In Spring Boot 3 they introduced this class called the Web Client which is reactive and fluent you know the output of each method is chained onto the input of the next method and so on and it, it's very nice and it replaces any other asynchronous mechanism, but it can also be used in synchronous form just by blocking on the calls. And I've used that a fair amount. Well, a lot of people think if web client is the future, then they'd like a REST template that looked and felt kind of like the web client, web client, except it was synchronous. So that's what's coming. That's this new REST client, which is going to be basically a web client that doesn't have Flux and Mono in it. Now in Spring Boot 3, they also introduced these new HTTP exchanges. And right now, if you're on Spring Boot 3.1, the only way you could use them is with a web client under the hood. Even though it'll write the web client code for you, you still have to create the bean. Well, in 3.2, you'll be able to create a REST client instead and then go with blocking calls and the simpler model doesn't get as confusing or complicated in terms of the API. So I'm, again, waiting for all this. I'm kind of eager to see that. Now, Dan made a video about the REST client class. I had made a video about HTTP exchanges after his. In fact, I kind of mimicked his. I'd called it CSI Dan Vega, but that joke was completely lost. Uh, <laughs> I'm probably going to have to change the the thumbnail and everything on if I want anybody to watch it. But I had worked with the HTTP interfaces in a video, which I'll link in, in this video to, to uh, access that JSON placeholder service, which Dan had introduced me to. Well, this time, here's his video on the REST client itself. And he did it, he used it both directly and as part of the HTTP interfaces, both features of which will be enabled in Spring Boot 3.2. So he used the milestone version and worked out the video and it all went very well. I thought it was very, very interesting there. While I was watching that or after I watched that, I thought I've got some catching up to do. And I also watched his video on parsing YAML with the Jackson parser. And I had no idea you could do that. And that was very interesting also because it showed how to do some external configuration that I have not done before. Spring is such a huge API, you can use it for years and years and still not be aware of whole sections of the API. <laughs> so that was my learning opportunity as well. Next section. Friday night, my wife surprised me with tickets. We went to the Mohegan Sun to see the comedian Craig Ferguson. If you're not aware of Craig Ferguson, I put a link to the Wikipedia page. There's a lot of ticket sales pages I saw associated with him. I don't know that he has a homepage himself or it hadn't been updated in a while if he has. He is a comedian and yes, as opposed to the ice hockey player, Craig Ferguson. <laughs> no, this is Craig and he used to be the host of The Late Late Show, the show that came on after The Letterman Show was over. And we used to time shift it. You know, we would dare I say, tape it or certainly record it and then, you know, watch it during the evening rather than way, way late at night. And it was great. We, we had a really good time with it. And his sense of humor is a riot. And he's among the best um, in, at improv I've ever seen. And he's an old guy. I mean, he's actually the same age I am. I think I have, oh, is it, if I look at his birthday there, I'm two months, almost exactly two months older than he is. So at <laughs> any rate, he was on tour. And, oh, those of you who are young enough not to remember any of the Late Late Show, he also played Gobber in How to Train Your Dragon. He was the voice of Gobber in the animated movie. And he did, he's done several other things. You can take a look at the Wikipedia page. But he is on tour. And his uh, Twitter feed, by the way, is Craigie Ferg. And I put that in there. And there's his little tweet about it. You know, proving a comedian can both suck and blow at the same time. Take that loss of physics. Yes, that's Greg for you. We had a great time. We really enjoyed him. I've seen him like three times, and that was a lot of fun. So it's about a 45-minute drive to get down there. But we went down early. We had a nice dinner. We went to the show. It was, you know, it's like an old date night. It was fun. But I just thought I'd mention it. Okay, and now let's move to our toots and skeets. I had no desire to talk about Elon yet again. I really didn't want to talk about Elon at all. I mean, I, I'm sick of it. 
and yet he went over the top. So I did this little dialogue with a supposed editor, you know, don't, don't go there, don't do it. And that's first he picked a fight with the Anti-Defamation League of all people, claiming that they are harassing his clients uh, so that they refuse to advertise on Twitter. And that's responsible for cutting billions of dollars off the bottom line of Twitter because, of course, it couldn't be his fault, could it? I mean, there's no way it could be his fault. And here he's going and blaming the Jews. I mean, I, this is 2023 and you're doing something like that. And then he went and the the new biography that's coming out, I believe tomorrow, is claiming that he deliberately cut off the Starlink satellite system in the vicinity of Ukraine just as they were about to mount a drone attack on the Russian Navy thereby sparing the Navy or many of the ships in the process, allowing them to continue launch missiles and shells at defenseless civilians, including children, you know? I mean, I don't even know where to, where to start with that. I like this image, however, you know, Joseph Starlink, as opposed to Stalin, yes. But that's, that's enough. I did like this comment, however, it's worth reminding Musk's fanboys that these are the brilliant men who founded Tesla. Elon was just a Series A investor who bought in, then sabotaged the company enough until these men were pushed out, and then he spent the next 10 years telling everyone he founded Tesla. The company was actually found by, founded by Mark Tarpening and Martin Eberhardt. There you go. To think that three years ago we thought he was Tony Stark, and we were so wrong. Let's move on. Google. Remember when Google's motto for many years was don't be evil? I don't know what's happened to that, but it is long gone. There was an article that was sent in on all over social media. There was an article in Ars Technica about Google gets its way, bakes a user tracking ad platform directly into Chrome over the overwhelming objections of everybody who doesn't work for Google. Just terrible. And it's worse. They make a claim like they're helping out, you know. Now, here's a link to that article if you want it. I'm not going to go there now. But the trick is in Chrome, and I'm using Chrome at the moment because of other client-related reasons. If you go to the settings, and then you select over on the left here, privacy and security, and then there's an entry called add privacy. Customize the info used by sites to show you ads. There are three separate entries here, add topics, site suggested ads, and ad measurement. And if you click on each one, you have to click the little toggle to turn it off. So you got to go through all three and turn them all off one by one to disable all this. And yet they have all their things to consider trying to persuade you to do this anyway, you know, to leave it on. And everybody says all it does is collect lots of information about everywhere you go and offer it to anyone who asks for it. I mean, oh my goodness. So yeah, stop that if you can. Ultimately, switch to Firefox. I mean, what the heck? But And I do use Firefox for a lot of things, but there's some things I have no choice. All right, let's get away from the unhappy stuff and let's get to some funnier stuff. This one called Some Perspective. It said, and now for something completely different. These were three different comments all in a thread said it's homo sapiens, not hetero sapiens. It's the Bible, not the straight bull. <laughs> in a response, straight people are in the notes arguing with this. And then it's not queer to hell, it's straight to hell. You know, I mean, it's people who play word games. You can play word games however you want. That's the point they're making. It, it doesn't mean anything. It has no significance, you know. So I had to throw in maybe it really was Adam and Steve all along. Okay. Just a reminder that as far as I'm concerned, LBGTQIA+, whatever you like, all welcome wherever I am. This was a good analogy, I thought. This was great. It said, my mind is like an internet browser. 19 tabs are open, three of them frozen, and I have no idea where the music's coming from. That one, of course, is really a problem, right? Where the heck is that music coming from over and over again? This was clever, fun with names. Uh, MC Hammer stands for Minor Celebrity Hammerhead Shark. <laughs> or Ice-T is short for Icebox Thermostat. Yes, of course. But the best, I think, again, Boba Fett's real name is Robert Fettuccini. Explains so much. Uh, this was clever. In case of outrage, clutch tightly. There's a 
display of pearls, of course. Got to clutch those pearls because you're outraged. Yes. And this one, no Hanson brother is an island. Ask not for who the whom the m mm bops. It bops for thee. <laughs> That's great. I love it. This one, you could make the argument, real life has too much Kobayashi Maru and not enough Kolinar. Yeah, again, for those, I don't know, 1% of readers of my newsletter who didn't get the reference, the Kobayashi Maru was the no-win situation displayed at the beginning of the second Star Trek movie, The Wrath of Khan, uh, who's, by the way, the trainee in that movie was played by Kirstie Alley went on to Cheers and many other things, turned out to be a vile individual who knew, but boy, it's a long time ago. I think that's 1982, something like that, 81, 82. Kolinar, of course, was the discipline that Spock was undergoing in the first Star Trek movie, the motion picture, where, which is the complete removal of all emotion. Yeah, good luck with that. I think Kolinar is kind of overrated. I'd settle for more Jamaharon, Jamaharon being what they use on the... the vacation planet Risa in Deep Space Not and Actually, that was also in Next Gen, wasn't it? That was Next Gen and in, Ry in um, Deep Space Nine. That's all I'm going to say about that one. You can Google it if you like. This was uh, didn't turn out to be as funny as I was hoping. It was a reference to uh, rewriting I'm a Believer. I think the reason this was done was because of the, the lead singer of Smash Mouth passed away. Again, not a terribly good individual, but Smash Mouth's biggest money-making thing, the thing that made them their fortune, was, of course, a cover of the Monkey song, I'm a Believer, which they wound up not only in the movie Mystery Men, which I happen to love, but also in Shrek. And that Shrek one made them a fortune and all of that. And this was all done with plums in the tune, I'm a plum thiever. So I'm not going to sing it for you. This is things long enough as it is. But I did go to GPT-4 and ask it to finish the song. And it's frankly kind of disappointed. I thought it would be more clever than this. Although I liked what's the use in buying. All you get is gone. When I needed plums, I got none. I thought that was pretty good. So I'm a plum thiever. Couldn't leave them if I tried. Well, okay. Anyway, I threw it in. Have a great week, everybody. We had a lot of fun this week. I'm going to try to make another technical video if I can. I will mention that I did have my first Trinity course, and that went a lot. That was quite successful, although I went long. What a shock. The second meeting will be tonight. It's going to be every Monday, Wednesday throughout the fall. And I'll let you know, I'm trying to lean toward keeping that a bit more private for them, you know. But I'll tell you if something interesting comes up uh, during our discussions. I am planning to have a more extensive discussion tonight about JUnit and maybe property-based testing with JQuick. If so, I'll let you know next week. Thank you for listening. Take care, everybody.